Welcome everybody to Spirituality Adventures. This is a non-judgmental place to explore spirituality, and we're so glad you're here. This is a viewer and listener supported podcast, so we greatly appreciate your support. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Be sure and like, share, and subscribe to any of the social media content platforms that you're using. And then if you go to our website, spiritualityadventures.com, you can make a one-time donation or with a monthly subscription, you'll gain access to our bonus content. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in. All right. Welcome everybody to Spirituality Adventures. We are uh, excited to have Kurt Shellman here with us today. Kurt, thanks for joining us on Spirituality Adventures. Uh, it's a pleasure. I'm happy to be here. Good to see you. Uh, this is fun having one of my close friends on on the show with us, and uh, and particularly one of my cycling friends. Right, those are my favorite friends of all. <laughs> yeah, so let's uh, let's have you tell a little bit of your story and uh, introduce yourself to those who are listening in our audience. Um, where you grew up, a little bit about your your background growing up, and uh, and then kind of move into your running and cycling career. Okay. Yeah. Um, grew up in South Central Kansas, uh, area Pratt, Kingman County area in South Central Kansas, very small town. You know, I think our graduating class had, and we were an enormous graduating class with 36 kids right. and usually it was 20. Uh, so anyway, grew up there, um, uh, was a, uh, uh, one of the faster kids in in school uh, all the way through. I mean, from when I was real little all the way up, I was one of the fastest kids. And so I followed that path because my father, he loved track and field and he thought that he, he knew that it would help me go further in life, could help me get an education. So I always kind of uh, embrace that and help me do that. Um, and my- Like, so did you start running like track and cross country when you were how old i probably st i started uh fifth sixth grade wow uh, and uh i think i had my first pair of track spikes when i was in the sixth grade they were size three men's i was wow. little. i was like four feet nine and 70 pounds Man, you started and you started i started several years before started real, yeah started yeah. real young and huh. uh very uh was that, and your dad was the one that encouraged you to yeah do that? dad um my father was a custodian and my mom was a waitress in a really small town uh mostly it was a farming community and um dad didn't finish high school mom had a ged uh dad always thought it would be in, in a better place if i could go to college I wasn't a very good student, so <laughs> I wasn't going to get an academic scholarship. Let's put it that yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. And I, he didn't really understand what it meant, but he always thought you couldn't. He, and he, his hero at that time, or he followed really closely, was Jim Ryan, who was from Wichita, Kansas. Yeah. Fastest miler at the time and everything. Right. And first high school senior to run under four minutes for the mile yeah that's still in like 1963 still hardly, yeah I know, that's still yeah. hard to believe still hard it? to believe and he went to the olympics before his senior year after his junior year between junior in and high senior, school in high school he went to the olympics i didn't remember yeah. that yeah he made three olympic teams but he's from wichita which was 60 miles right. away and uh jim um went to KU and KU right. took care of him, helping get an education. I, my father saw that. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm no Jim Ryan. So anyway, yeah. but he saw there was an opportunity for that. And, and, and he knew that they were not going to have the means for me to go there, not on the salary of a small school custodian. And so uh, um, he always encouraged me. My father was a, a pretty good runner in his day. Um, he, I think I still have one of his trophies from 1929 when he was he was a high point man at the uh, track meet. So it's a little silver cup, says high point man. He won the, got second in the 100, won the 220, and won the 880. Mm. Which and yeah. uh, and so it, and so I still have that little sterling silver. That's quite cup. a span, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, the, going from the hundred to the eight eighty. Yeah, it's it like... was too. Yeah, it was too <laughs> close between the two hundred and the four hundred. So he ran the eight eighty and won it. And wow. I think in nineteen twenty nine he'd have been a, he'd been seventeen and uh -huh. uh, 
he went to about his sophomore year in high school and that was where his education ended and i think he said that um he i think he ran a 204 half mile That's back in that time which is pretty respectable especially if you're running a uh, hundred yeah, yard yeah. dash right so uh, yeah. but farm labor oil field work and that's where he ended yeah. up at and uh and so never had the opportunity to pursue that and i think he thought it was an opportunity for me and, and it did get me to college so i ended up at fort hayes state we ended up our senior in high school a, a teammate we formed a cross-country team so we were at Pratt Skyline High School, mm-hmm. small school again, 35 kids. We, first year we had cross country, we had the two best runners in our classes, uh, Lonnie G and myself, and we went first and second at state and we won the team title. So as I think it's the only state championship that school's ever had for the boys. <laughs> and so, and that was, fall, that was fall of 1975. So it's, uh, it's crazy. 46 years ago. Anyway. Yeah. And ended up at Fort Hayes and ran at Fort Hayes. Did Lonnie um, go to and Fort Lonnie, So Lonnie yeah, this is Fort one Hayes, of your so. longtime friends that, yep. that I've come to know yeah. here over yeah. the last few years. Yeah. And he ran at Fort Hayes too. And he ran Were you guys both Hayes the same well. age? Same age, graduated okay. together. Okay. And uh, he. And well, tell us what your times were in high school, just for those who heard track, track. Yeah, nerds. my, uh, my best time in high school for the two mile at that time, which now they call it the 3200. Right. So it's uh 1003 was my best two mile time, okay. which converts to a 959 3200. So okay. I was, anyway, and then uh, the mile, my best mile time was 437. Okay. Uh, Lonnie was uh, 420 six for the mile or mm-hmm. something like that and he ran 933 for two miles so okay. he was better in high school than i was uh, mm-hmm. and uh uh i think we matched up a little bit better and i beat him quite a few times in college yeah so yeah so fort hayes you did cross country and track as fort well fort hayes did uh cross country indoor and outdoor track mm-hmm. uh and uh and this was what an was this an NAI school when you were there? They were NAI school. Now they're division, they're NCA division two. Okay. And so oh, it's all the same schools like Pittsburgh state, Emporia state, Fort Hayes, all those schools mm-hmm. went to division two, Northwest Missouri, you know, those types of schools mm-hmm. are all NCA division two schools. Yeah. So I was fortunate enough. I made uh, all American three times uh, yeah. as a cross country, all American, indoor, all American and an outdoor, all American. And there's only eight athletes from Fort Hayes that have ever been all American in all three of those sports. Wow. So I'm one of the eight and That's cool. they haven't had one recently. We had a fantastic coach. His name was Alex Francis. He was an Olympic coach in 1968. Yeah. And they also asked him to be the coach in 72, but he opted out of that. Uh, but he had some fantastic runners in his days. He was at Fort Hayes for 34 years, had something like 140 some All-Americans in his years. Wow. There. So my senior year was his, he turned 70 my senior year and had to retire after that. Okay. So, so. very cool. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, so, uh, let's let's what tell us what your times were in college uh let me see my 1500 meter time was 354 uh my 5000 meter time was about 1440 something uh ran like a 154 800 relay carry one time in a four by eight um I ran faster after college because I kept pursuing it. Yeah. Uh, trying what was to make your Olympic mile trials. in college? Uh, or, that would convert to about a, we didn't run the mile, mostly ran the 1500. So we'd be mostly a conversion. Uh, I think it's 410, 411 would be what the conversion would be. Yeah. Uh, I ended up running right about 405 uh, after college. Mm-hmm which is still really a long ways from four minutes. It's, it's still, but still a long so, ways. So fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My, my fastest high school mile was 435, and then okay. I never re- ran it again. Oh, yeah. 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 So um, I, I was, you know, I became a road runner, so I was running 5Ks, right. 10Ks, and marathons, and, and uh, yeah. 
We always get to have track chats when we're out, yeah right. We'll always no, talk I, about old times. I love it because it was uh, it it was such a great sport for me, and I always loved yeah. the people that I met through the sport mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, great. You know, I mean, anytime you get even, cl- I don't know, four oh five is a that's a fast time. Yeah. I, I, uh, yeah. I, I've shared with you how um, when I was at Baylor, one of my close friends was was a scholarship cross country and track guy, and so I started training typically in the off season with some of the the guys on the track team. My really so my really close friend was really close friends with Todd Harbor, and Todd is now the head track coach of Baylor, yeah. but. Um, he you you ended up running across him he (laughs) he ended up i think his senior year still collegiate qualified ended up in a race over in oslo with ovet and co in the race he took like sixth or seventh in the race and i think he ran three fifty point something yeah or or might have been just under 350 i mean he was very accomplished and you know yeah i think it's still like the fifth fastest american mile that's ever run and i still i think it's still the collegiate mile record might be um i'm not 100 percent sure on that but any rate uh you ran across him like you ended up racing against him a few times i was in dallas for the flagpole five mile which was on the fourth of july and probably 19 83 or 82 somewhere in that time frame mm-hmm. and, and he had just come back from europe and i think uh it was a five mile race and i think it with one mile to go i was sitting in fourth place uh behind some other really good runners and and everything i was sitting in fourth place and there was a guy behind me and i think he was eight eight seconds behind me and he beat me by four seconds and i ran a 431 last mile gosh <laughs> so, <laughs> so so do the math Ooh. he did a so eight four twelve so yeah so he did a 418 419 wow. last mile wow and uh, we got to run and cool down together afterwards and that's how we got to comparing what our splits were interesting and so yeah he was definitely a talent so yeah, definitely so you but you kind of pursued running after college like what describe that a little bit for people because there is were you kind of on a semi pro type deal or what would you call that well i think that when we were at, at when i was at fort hayes they'd had some uh some some really good runners a, a, a man by the name of john mason who had broke the four minute mile 32 times when he was at fort hayes and he was an alternate on the 72 olympic team and one of the fastest milers in the world at that time beat kip kano who was an olympic champion and some races and stuff and so he went on afterwards and i think that inspired a lot of us to continue running after college to go um can we go to Europe? Can we travel? Can we make Olympic trials and things? And I had some other teammates that a guy named Fred Tornaden that had ran 211 for the marathon. 211 Ooh. is not so fast now, but at that time the world record was like 208, right. 207. So yeah. he, uh, and so he, and he was a year ahead of me. So he inspired us to keep chasing that dream a little bit. How mm. fast can we run? Mm-hmm. And uh, so, um, and, and at that time there was, Nike was pouring money into the sport. And I mean, a, a lot of the big shoe companies, Reebok, were, they were pouring money into the sport. So I was able to uh, get my equipment provided. Usually you could have the gear and shoes and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. And sometimes travel money. And we had a group out of Wichita that put some teams together and supported us to get our travel taken care of so we could go to the larger meets and things yeah. like that. So, yeah. so it was, it was a, cool. and you know, my goal is always to try and make the Olympic trials. I never thought I'd make the Olympics. I just want to make the trials. Right. And, yeah, I, I fell about eight seconds short and of the, in the 5,000, but it's okay. Yeah. Know? Yeah. So, yeah. So how did you get into cycling? I think mostly I f- I can't, I, I ran until I was about 34 and, but I was started to become injury plagued. Uh, mm-hmm. and as most runners do, you know, you get, they get enough miles on enough hard miles. You start having, uh, injury problems and, and I, and I still like to compete and 
off and on when I was running, I'd do a little bit of cycling. I always had a bicycle, it seemed like. So once I got to where I couldn't run anymore, I decided just, well, I'm just going to start riding. And right. So I started mixing in with race groups and started racing. So that's kind of, I think it was just a, uh, I, I just pivoted, just shifted mm -hmm. gears from competing as a runner to competing as a cyclist. Yeah. So, what year did you start cycling competitively? I think the first year I licensed with USA Cycling to become a racer was 91. Wow. So 30 years ago. Okay. Yeah, 91, crazy. 92. Yeah. You've basically been competing your whole life. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Since the that's, fifth or sixth grade, right? That's, <laughs> yeah, for some reason. Yeah, always always kind of, it's, it's kind, kind of wired that way. You know, you think something. about that. There's not that many people out there that, that do that yeah a lot of people are smarter yeah i think then <laughs> there's something wrong with us Kurt. <laughs> yeah, oh, oh, definitely. but see i'm still around you so i still think i'm normal right? yeah so, <laughs> that's right that's right what well, is perfectly normal within our group yes <laughs> that's funny oh gosh yeah so um wow so how did you let's talk about sh uh, pace line and chamois butter how did you get into i know you, you've had you've kind of we, I don't want to go into all your career history, but, yeah. but, per, but I do want to get to the chamois yeah. butter pace line yeah. stuff. What, well, it, how it, did you connect with that? The, the and, quick and describe to the people yeah. what that company is. Sure. And well, the quick, the quick entry to that was I'd been in corporate wellness and fitness and I was contracted to the Boeing company in Wichita. And then, uh, after nine 11 and some things like that, aircraft took a big hit and ended up selling part of the plant off and I was contracted. So I was looking for a job and I had, I had helped the owner of Paceline products and founder of it, Steve Matthews, um, right here in Liberty, Missouri area, Kansas city area. Um, he needed help at their national, at the national trade show. And I just happened to be available. So for two or three years, I'd gone along to that trade show with Steve, took time off from work, my contract job at Boeing, and uh, would go to Vegas for a week and help at a trade show. Uh, a lot of really hard work, but it it gave me an in and and I you know figured out what the company was doing. At that time, it was very small. Steve had one had himself and a part time person working, and that was it. Mm -hmm. Small. I think they were mostly working out of their out of a machine shed on his property okay and um and and as the company grew a little bit got bigger the brand chamois butter uh became a little bit larger and finally about the time my contract and my position ended uh when i was at boeing went to interbike and steve says i'm i think we're getting big enough i'm going to need some help and i said well it's good because i'm going to need a job and so we, <laughs> i came up and visited this would have been uh fall of 2005 mm -hmm. And I came up and visited, thought like it was uh, it was the best option I had on the table, being that was the only option I had on the table at that time because everything's a little bit tight uh, and everything. So mm -hmm. I I started with Paceline in in uh, November one of '05. Wow. It was my first day of, of work there. Wow. Now and at that time there was a part time person, Steve, and then I was the first full time employee of the company yeah, and we're in a, we were in a small warehouse at that time. And, uh, um, it's family owned business. Uh, Steve and his wife, Mitzi, she was a physician. Um, and the company just, I think out of pure stubbornness some years, I think Steve kept it moving and kept it alive. And, and, 20 years later it became a success and so right you know, that's what we always yeah, joke so about let's, so let's yeah. let's let's try to describe this for our non-cycling friends yeah. that are listening here right so our, our cycling buddies are going to track with this and you know maybe we can post this on shammy butter site sure. and that kind of thing yeah. too but yeah um so pace line is a uh distributes all kinds of cycling products is that right yes we so, we don't do as many as we used to. When I started with the company in 05, we probably distributed 15 other brands. We would buy other products and we'd sell them to bike shops. And we, we've, in that time, chamois butter was smaller. And, but as it's grown, we've done some good marketing and some, and it's become more popular. We don't put as much emphasis on distributing those other brands. So, um, so we, we distribute four or five other brands, but mostly 
70 to 80 percent of what we do is our product just chamois butter right now yeah so and, tell people what chamois butter is that's what yeah. people I always tell people yeah. i ride for chamois butter and yeah. they're going like what's chamois, well, butter, right? chamois yeah. butter yeah well it's <laughs> it's um chamois butter the original formula has been out for 30 years it's 30 years old steve started it 30 years ago and uh what chamois butter is it's a skin lubricant uh we have and it's you know how small bike seats are like you're very well aware of how small bike seats are and in 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 cycling shorts there's a thing called a chamois or a chamois pad and you still you get a little bit of abrasion or you can get some friction build up or you can get some chafing and so chamois butter is a skin lubricant that helps prevent that uh, prevent from getting chafing and all chafing is is injuring your skin so chamois butter helps prevent injuring that region of your body right what contacts your seat so it's a it's a butt cream yeah and so i would say it's butt yeah, butter yeah. yeah it's butt butter which is a good <laughs> slang term for it and we have four formulas of it depending upon what each person likes and and dislikes mm -hmm. so to speak so we have original formula and like i said it's been out right at 30 years now so wow um, and the, like so like we you know like when i go cycling anywhere in the like I can be in Colorado, I can be in another state, I can yeah. be down in Sedona mountain biking. When people see my chamois butter outfit, my yeah. kit, yeah. as we call our, right. our cycling clothes, the purple and yellow. Right. Right. If they're cyclists, they'll go, hey, chamois butter, you know, like I use you, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how many, how many cycling shops is chamois, chamois butter in? Well, it's, um, give or take there's around they believe there's around five thousand independent bicycle shops in the united states mm -hmm. and we're in probably almost every one of them yeah uh, so think in, about yeah. so you could go to any bicycle shop anywhere in america and you'll see our purple and yellow chamois butter you'll see the cream tubes, yeah, yeah. You'll see the tubes hanging there yeah or it'll be an rei or shields and, okay. and there's a lot of online retailers as well so, okay yeah so and then what about in the european market well, we're in about 33 countries now. Wow. Uh, I think when I started, we were in Canada and the U.S. Mm -hmm. And now we're into 33 countries. We have, uh, and I think we're, we're still working to get into our two latest are France and Germany. But uh, you would think we'd be in France, but anyway. So, right. Yeah. So <laughs> but we're, we're uh, you know, we're in Australia and South Korea and United Kingdom and South Africa and Brazil and Colombia and, wow. you know, Norway and Belgium, you know, mm. so and Denmark. So Poland. So we just, you know, just uh, Luxembourg and uh that's I think, great. Yeah. Dubai, which is really oh, yeah. strange. I just had a had to get some documents over to Dubai this morning. So, wow. You know, but yeah, I I was in Dubai in 2018 for, okay. uh, for a short period yeah. of time. But um, and then what about at one time you tried to cross over into the motorcycle world that did that? How, what happened with that? Well, we. We knew quite a quite a few or several motorcycle shops would also carry our product because enduro riders would experience chafing a little bit. So some would use it and they were saying, we got some recommendations. Hey, change the label, it, make it look a little more motorcycle rather than purple and yellow. So it was kind of a black and red and white label and named it butt wax. And, <laughs> and, uh, and it just never really quite took off. Uh, I think the difference is like motorcyclists will use it on really long extended endurance type rides, but a bicyclist will use it almost every ride. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference between how often it needed. And we still find motorcyclists use our product as long as, and as well as equestrian riders and oh, my wife and horse. So a lot of, yeah. a lot of the um, endurance trail riders use our product and, and uh, swear by it. So okay. it's pretty interesting. So, Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Good we're not, stuff. Yeah, we're not available in tractor supply yet, but you know we're <laughs> we're getting there. <laughs> yeah, John Deere and you know <laughs> we right. go green, yellow, purple. <laughs> yeah, we'd, we'd yeah. really uh, do it up, wouldn't we? Um, well, let's talk a little bit about uh, about sort of the cycling world and spirituality and a little bit like that. Now, maybe maybe just for for 
for folks. What tell us a little bit about your spiritual journey? What what uh, what are you comfortable sharing on that that side of thing? Well, I, I always struggled when I was little. We we'd go to a church and it was all fire and brimstone, and you know, and I just thought I'm I'm never going to make this because I. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm dead already. I can't, I, I, I'll never, it was seemed like there was no, I didn't understand grace or forgiveness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I thought every mistake meant that's, I'm just, I'm just paving the road to hell mm. right here because I'm not going to be able to yeah. do this. Right. And so, um, and, and that was, that was kind of, I don't know, 1950s, 60s, 70s churches and things like that a really strong catholic community that i grew up in didn't go to the catholic church but um so i always struggle with that mm -hmm. and i think when i went to vineyard and, and i hadn't gone to church for years and years and years mm -hmm. and so when my wife stacy and i moved to uh kansas city area we started mm -hmm. attending the vineyard church because i heard the guy that was the pastor there rode a bike <laughs> and so <laughs> and and turned out we'd actually race them against each other even prior to that. Uh, yeah, that I, was funny. I, yeah, I still have a wheel to prove it. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, we got to explain that yeah, real quick. Yeah, but uh, no, it's serious. Yeah, stop and explain that yeah. just real quick. Well, I uh, Fred and I ran a race in Overland Park area one time. Corporate Woods, I believe, is where it was. I think it was. We're in a Criterium, which it was is in a, the Kansas State Championships. I think right? it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so we're, it's a very tightly packed, tightly competitive group. I was and on the, sh on, on the uh, Cowtown team, I right. think at the You're time, the, yeah. this yeah. would have been what, you, do you remember what year this would have been? Like this probably would have been about, um, when I, it's been about, oh, probably oh four. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh three, oh four. Oh, oh three, oh four. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. And, uh, so yeah, I think we were in a criterion. We're coming in top of that last hill getting ready to the last corner and we've probably got a couple laps to go and i don't know the pack always moves and flows and shrinks and or you know spreads out and shrinks yeah, back and, and there might have been a hundred guys in this there, race yeah, about a, you yeah, know it and we're a good all racing field. inches apart and, yeah and, and, and i going. think we just kind of found ourselves both in the same place at the same time and i uh my front wheel got into uh your rear skewer on your bike and started pinging spokes and uh so it put a bend in one of the spokes and and uh we just came across that wheel the other day i still have it it's actually in my office and i had to pointed out to you that it still has so still we have almost the bent crashed each other out yeah and and you you've said many times it was my fault right yeah, <laughs> yeah i wasn't yeah. i wasn't sticking <laughs> yeah. on my line i was yeah. Yeah. i was kind of breaking to the outside to try to get around the pack and and well, it, do some points or something yeah. in cycling it's always someone else's fault and of course <laughs> right. uh, the, the thing is i was behind you so it was really my fault really but uh, well, i think you moved a little bit abruptly one time so uh that that's probably what did it so. i i did because I was under total yep. control. That's so. right. <laughs> yeah, but we didn't know each other, and yeah. we didn't figure that out until after we were riding together. Right. Some, yeah. And so I think then we would have met when you moved to Kansas City. How did how did we connect when you got to Kansas City? I think that's when um, a, a common a friend of mine, Greg Reed, and I knew your name, and mm -hmm. we and and stuff like that, and I think. We determined that at the vineyard, which Stacey and I moved to Kansas City, we lived in Smithville, mm -hmm. which is about two miles from the vineyard. And so we decided uh, we wanted to go to the vineyard and check it out. And and I felt like I wanted to be more involved with a church in some way. And I thought, well, let's, I think I can relate to Fred. Yeah. And so, uh, cause he rides a bike and, right. stuff, and I need to know people that ride bikes around here. So I think that's when we first, right after we went, we sat in top three or four rows up on the right side that would always sit on. And afterwards I went up and approached you afterwards. And then we got to talking there and we go. started going for bike rides together. Yeah. And, uh, you took me out with Ed and Mike and, and, uh, <laughs> we went on one of those rides and, <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> that yeah, was that some was, colorful language. Yeah, there. right. That yeah. was the Ed Knoll. Uh, um, yeah, I, re I can remember that first ride. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I remember yeah. I remember uh, 
Yeah. Anyway. Ed, yeah. <laughs> Ed Ed was always a colorful person to ride bikes with. Ed was always always colorful. provided color commentary on all of our rides. Yeah. Yeah. yeah <laughs> yes. Indeed. <laughs> But, you know, no one was ever going to mess with us when Ed was along. That's right. Because he was going to take care of us. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, uh, I, he, I thought, you know, when you're fully tatted, you know, arms, yeah. legs everywhere, and, and you're in spandex, that's about the only way that you really look cool in spandex, yeah. I think. It's yeah. like, yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. Yeah. Or look tough. Right, right. Yeah, you look yeah, tough. Like, yeah. Otherwise, you know, you're It's just... pretty hard to look tough in, <laughs> right. in some of the costumes that we're wearing. So, you know, um, but. I remember one time um, Scott Rogers, Ben Bolin, myself. I can't remember who else was with us. Maybe Dave Hudson. Maybe maybe another, uh, maybe, maybe another person. Well, we were down. We were mountain biking in Sedona. Oh, okay. So, so. Uh, so Tim Place Grizz never went with us on yeah. that one. But anyway, we were we were in Sedona and we were coming through this sort of touristy spot, still on single track, but in a place where people walked. And and we went, I think four of us went by in our chamois butter kits, you know, yellow yeah. and purple. And this lady goes, Oh look, <laughs> costumes. <laughs> yeah, <that's right>. <laughs> 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 we, were, we were just flying by and i heard this lady oh look costumes look like a like, parade yeah, yeah it's like it's halloween yeah, yeah that's right <laughs> it anyway. is it, it could pass sometimes right, i right. think yes <laughs> that's funny okay so we we probably ri started riding in 2005 and then what year did you get the chamois butter team going we've we toyed around finally got it started probably about 2007 Okay. Maybe 2008. Yeah. Um, you and know, I we really, the biggest, strongest present when we started getting associated with the Dirty Konza and, and doing, you know, 2011, 2010, yeah. 11, we kind of started, more and more people entered the sport and right. wanted to do stuff with the gravel and everything. That's right. when it became stronger. So, yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Dirty Konza, let's, uh, let's chat just a little bit about that. Um, yeah. Because you guys were one of the early sponsors of Dirty Cons, is that right? Right, right. And it started in what what year? Two thousand ten, maybe or something. No, I believe it actually started in 06. 06, Okay, I believe. Um, and what twenty five, thirty guys or gals I think show 34 up? Thirty four people entered that first year. And Did like, you do it that first no. year? Okay, my very first year was two thousand eleven. We always okay always thought about doing it, but I just really couldn't picture much desire to go do 200 miles right. on gravel roads in one day and I know. in in june in central kansas right know. in the flint hills yeah. right but uh yeah but it was it jim uh jim cummins jim cummins who started that first had that first 34 jim, people yeah jim cummins and joel dyke okay uh, and uh joel has since passed away about six seven years ago had a home accident and and died uh but he and jim kind of had the brainchild to put it together and make it a real epic not just 100 miles but let's make it 200 miles mm. and let's make it so you have to f navigate yourself you have to follow a map and all that mm -hmm. and uh and i think they um i think they set it up where the first year one would one would ride one year and the other would direct and then they'd flip positions the next year if Joel rode the first year, Jim would direct the race. The next year, be Joel would direct it and Jim would ride it because mm -hmm. they were kind of doing it because that's what they wanted to do. And then it so it grew from thirty four people to I think in two thousand eleven, the first year we did it, they had three hundred and fifty people, and now it's three thousand people participate in the whole adventure. Yeah. You know, the yeah. weekend. Try to describe this to people. Um, so this was early on gravel racing when a lot of people weren't doing gravel racing, right? right when right. he started this thing in 2006. Now in the cycling world, gravel racing has become a rage. I mean, everywhere all over the United States, people are sponsoring gravel races all over. Right. But this was one of the first ones. Um, we, I know that um, as it gained in popularity, we started... We, we drew in, I remember one year racing against Chris Carmichael, who was Lance Armstrong's coach. Yeah. I remember um, one year Jens Voigt was in the race, yeah. who was a 20-time a Tour de France guy, right, from yeah. Germany. Yeah, 
Yeah. Uh, we've had huge names get in this tour. And and some of the guys that did the Tour de France, some of the guys that did the one-day European classic stage races, right. um, and then have ridden Dirty yeah. Konza, and they were trying to say, you know, like there's this whole thing about what's the toughest one-day race yeah. in the world, Yeah. right? Yeah. What was the conclusion of some of these guys that have I, done I them all? Most of them thought that the Dirty Konza was the toughest, the toughest day. one yeah. day yeah. race in the world. It just just because it's so self supporting, you know, in larger pro races in Europe, I mean, they have a caravan of cars behind them. They don't have to worry about mechanicals. They get handed a new bike, or the mechanic hands them a new set of wheel. You know, it's all taken care of. DK, you're between your checkpoints. You're 50 miles between checkpoints, you're self-supporting. You can't get help. You got to make sure you carry everything that you're going to need or fix it yourself or bum it off somebody else that happens to ride by and feels generous enough to let you have whatever it is that you need, a spare tube or something like yeah. that. So yeah, it makes it really tough. Yeah. I mean, you're literally carrying all your water, all of your food, all of your tools that you need to yeah. fix your, your bike if you break down. Yeah. It's yeah. like crazy yeah yeah um yeah and you guys started sponsoring uh this race in 2011 right right and then you've sponsored you've been a sponsor every year since yes. is yeah. that right yeah and uh what it, you uh so you've finished it how many times i'm just curious i've got uh i finished the 209 times i'm nine for nine so nine uh, for nine yeah so i've ridden it four times and finished it three okay yeah yeah and the yeah. first time i see i thought you had more than that uh -uh. for some reason no yeah. i rode it four and finished it three i trained for it more i even trained for it but there was like one time i, I i've had a couple of times where i got sick or injured or whatever yeah. and didn't yeah. and didn't end up being able to compete I mean, after just, i trained yeah you know? just just to not get sick or not have a mechanic or yeah. not or eat incorrectly or whatever just the training it takes to get to that yeah. point you know yeah the first time i tried it i crashed twice down onto my same shoulder that's right wound up i, I made it like i was almost riding one-handed for right. about 70 miles and pulled out at the 105 yeah. mile mark wound up in the what went to the hospital and went to the hospital yeah. and wound up on some drugs that knocked me silly and yeah, i, I think entered, there's some video out there somewhere i, knew, with I that, entertained so. everybody the rest of the day i think <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but yeah um the first time i finished it was um whichever year it was with which was all the mud okay. like the year that we 2015 i think is yeah we so i mean we were crossing creeks that were up to yeah. our crotch you know <laughs> yeah. yeah we we were hiking our bikes like we had to pick our bikes up you could not ride through this stuff it was yeah. so muddy in sections that we were hiking miles yeah yeah literally miles with mud clumped up onto our feet those yeah and it's like this clay just it's like your feet become like lead bricks you know when you're trying to hike or clown shoes yeah and you're you trying know? to hike yeah. your bike through this stuff <laughs> yeah and, yeah you can't roll the bike those b roads the clay is it sticks so much you can't even roll the bike you have to carry the bike it was and crazy so, yeah, I, we, yeah i started at 6 a.m and i finished by 10 30 p.m okay the first time yeah. so it was like 16 hour ride for me yeah, yeah. I, but yeah. i finished you know <laughs> our first finish i did it with my son 2011 we decided we rode the whole thing together and we uh it took us 17 hours and 40 minutes i think and it was the year that started off dry got it to 100 degrees and then it started raining and it rained and hailed and everything else on us and we had to do i think from like 130 to 140 miles it was that we were carrying bikes because it got so muddy and that's not a good time i mean if you're going to carry the bike do it early in the day right. but when you start doing it at at uh, after you've ridden 130 miles already right. now you've got to carry this mud covered now it's a 35 pound bicycle right. and you're carrying it and you're already kind of whacked and so Oof. but we we finished it that day and it was a it's it a, was a good day it's a tough it's a tough good day race yeah 
But you've podiumed a few times, right? Won my age group a few times. Yeah. Um, can about always make the podium. I think I've won the age my age group three times. I think. Yeah. Maybe four. Yeah. I can't remember for That's sure. Impressive. Yeah. It's, That's uh, with a big field and lots of lots of good good riders. So. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about cycling community as a you know as it relates to spirituality i was thinking of spirituality i always say it i like to think of it as connection or belonging to yourself to others and then and and then to something greater than yourself that's loving and caring and so when i think you know for me cycling is has spiritual components for me um and i'm i'm not, I'm not saying all cyclists think of it that right, way right but maybe as we describe as I, maybe as we talk about this and describe it, I think, I think many cyclists will relate, relate to some of these ideas, mm -hmm. you know, and, and for those who are not cyclists, I, one of the things that, um, uh, you know, because people know I cycle and I'm sure this happens to you all the time. We, we constantly get people asking us about how to get into cycling. Right. 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 So maybe this is for people who are thinking about getting into cycling as well. Yeah. And we would, we love the sport. We love the, even the recreational side of it. So we're always encouraging people to More get people. into cyclists. Yeah. Right. But yeah, let's talk a little like for you, is there a spiritual component to your cycling experience? You know, I think, I think it connects you. Now, the, it, it connects you with being outdoors and outdoors is a greater thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I always, I'm always uncertain on really what that exactly means sometimes. And I, so the story that I can relate to the most is, and it's a DK experience for me, a dirty cons experience, uh, which now we keep calling it DK. It's now called Unbound. Right. So just get that. But anyway, um, almost every year that I've done it, I've as I come into the third checkpoint, which every, the checkpoints are usually about 50 miles apart. So it's 150 miles in or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. And every time I'm coming in, and usually you're riding alone by then, and that's when I probably have what I call my – greatest spiritual connection and it's it's my dad always shows up hmm. and i don't think i've ever told you this i don't friend. think you so, have no i don't oh. think i've ever told you this interesting but, but my my father passed in 91 and so in 1991 and uh uh and he was always supporting him but dad shows up and i don't know why i'll be riding along and and i can feel him huh and 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 i don't know what it is and it gets weird because i are strange and it's it's i get uh, even now i kind of start to get a little bit i well up just a little bit because yeah. it's like i can feel i can feel dad there i'm coming to the checkpoint and i'm almost i'm almost in tears sometimes huh. because well you're you're emotionally stripped away right you're on the verge of exhaustion you're dehydrated you're hungry your blood sugar's low you're you're in your head the whole day hmm. with just yourself and you're out in a greater expanse of something the flint hills you're out there by yourself and it's all on you and you're coming to the checkpoint and that's where my wife is and other friends and 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 people that have pulled out for the day and they're all there encouraging you they're all willing you to be successful so there's that energy there too but and it's not that my I just feel my father's presence mm. because he was always supportive. So That's it's like, so going, I know I'm, I know I'm okay. Mm. I know I'm good. I know that I will go forward and get this done. I guess maybe he provides that stubbornness that I have mm. that I, I won't, I won't usually give up. All I'm right. pretty stubborn. And I think that's where, that's my, probably my greatest where I think there's something spiritual about it mm -hmm. is, is in that experience that yeah. I have. That's you know? interesting. And, Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Well, a funny thing too, I remember one year you, the, the very first year my son and I did, I don't think I've told this one to you either. And we were riding along, we'd left the second checkpoint and it's just hot, 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 hot. And one of Colin's water bottles popped out. He happened to be in front of me and I ran over it. Well, and it was a full water bottle and 
you don't want to be without a full water bottle. And so it's like, so as we're riding along and you don't go by many houses, I mean, there's no houses out there, literally no houses out there. And he's getting low on water and we're trying to, we're still 35 miles from the next checkpoint and it's hot, it's hundred degrees. And so we, I sit here and go, well, something will come along. We'll figure something out. There's no potable water and like that. And all of a sudden a, f- a farmhouse appears. And this is what was, it's a weird coincidence or is it a spiritual thing? I didn't, and I'd been down this road, but I didn't recall there were any farmhouses because I've ridden the Flint Hills a lot. We go, wow. So we pull in, there's a hydrant. We, we fill up with water and we're on our merry way. And I, that's when I pulled my phone out and there was a text from Fred that said, good luck today, guys. Hope you have a great ride. And you texted me that morning, but I hadn't seen it till we're at that farmhouse. Like that so moment. I was like going, wow, that's kind of like a- Interesting. It was a weird thing. Yeah, you know? yeah, Or yeah. a, you know, yeah. it, it was a moment of you affirmed or something. Yeah. You know, I don't really know how to describe that. But that's so, interesting. So I've had, I've had those things very around cool. the DK mm-hmm. because it's, I don't know, it's, I don't know why it is. It's because it's when you're out there challenging yourself and you're in your own head in a greater space yeah. and you're trying to figure things out. Yeah. It's so interesting, isn't it? I've, I've had so many experiences. I think a lot of ultra endurance athletes, you know, when they get into those long halls and they're in their head and there, there's something spiritual that happens in almost all of those people what no matter what they believe you know it doesn't matter really what background they're from spiritually but it's like there's something that that goes on in those kind of those kind of moments that's really fascinating one of the things i've loved about cycling is just the is the cyclists themselves and the Mm -hmm. community um the friendships and i think i think when we're supporting each other and you know think about you know, when, when we're down, I mean, when we're, you know, when I've gone through what I've gone through the last a couple of years, it's been some of the cycling guys that have been with me, that yeah. have supported me, that have really, um, emotionally, you know, sort of carried me through, mm-hmm. uh, some of this time you've been that per one of those people for me. And I, I appreciate it so much, but so for me, community, um, that connection to other people, when we're there for uh, each other in the, in the difficult times and the, you know, in the good times, right, when we're right. fun, when we're telling stupid stories and jokes and yeah. all of those things that happen together in community. But, you know, but, but there really is something that happens when we're there for each other and the community, the side community yeah. I've just found to be super good, supportive kinds of people. Once you really build, build relationships there. No, I, I agree 100%. I mean, it's a small community. I mean, you think, I mean, there are millions of bicycle riders, but there's, you know, it's it's pale in comparison to some of the other communities, you know, mm-hmm. like the soccer communities or the, or whatever else might be, you know, the automotive industry community. So, yeah. Right. But, but people do, they take, they look out for each other, they take care of each other. Mm-hmm. And there's always moments, you know, but, I, you know, how many times are we on a ride and we see someone stopped alongside the road with their bike? We don't know who they are, but we always offer. Mm-hmm. Or if we're stopped alongside the road, we don't know who, we don't know who they are, but they always offer. Yeah, it's because there's that caring, that community, the connection. That, right. You know, and I, I agree, and I, and I think, I mean, I, I go back through most of my friends. I mean, they're all my running mates or my cycling friends, mm-hmm. you know, they all, uh, I, I connect in that way. And, you know, it's someone you can count on. We mentioned Lonnie G. I mean, mm-hmm. earlier in this conversation and we talk twice a week. We've been mm-hmm. friends since freshman high school. Yeah. And yeah. so we, and we talk two times a week. Yeah. That's good stuff. Um, the other thing I think about in terms of cycling and spirituality is the mental health, physical health component to it. And, um, I, for me, I like to, it's like therapy for me. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a mental health side to, um, to these longer endurance kinds of activities that, that, uh, I don't know. Like if I don't get, if I don't get rides in, 
<laughs> I can actually start getting depressed. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's like, it's like crazy, but it's yeah. like, it actually plays into my, my sense of well being and my mm -hmm. mental health. If I'm not, if I'm not out in nature, not out getting, uh, you know, some endorphins yep. from the, yep. uh, from the cycling and the exercise, I tend to, I tend to not be, end up getting in, you know, weird head spaces, you know? Yeah. I, I don't sleep well. Uh, mm. if I don't get something, if I go three, four days and I've not had some release mm -hmm. and also I, it, it, I solve problems because you, everything else gets out of your head. So it allows your, uh, a solution to come into your head, yeah. I guess, you know, cause you can sit there and focus on a problem at work or mm -hmm. focus on some production thing we've got going on. As long as you're sitting there, keep pounding on the same nail, you just <laughs> never can get it. But you go out for a ride, we banter around, we tell a few jokes, we, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and and all of a sudden, uh, it, it'll free up the mind. It lets all the other stuff go, come out of the mind, so you can yeah. find solutions and also find yourself in your own space. So I, yeah. I'm I'm there with I like I work out so many things on a yeah. on a ride many times so yeah. it's so for me there's this prayer component there's there's that problem solving there's that connection with myself and yeah i've worked out well, it, a lot you know of it helps with you know exercise it helps it helps with you uh maintaining weight mm -hmm. keeping blood sugar keeping the heart the heart rate up and getting the aerobic bait i mean it just helps in a lot mm -hmm. of different ways but i think it's the mental clarity that's probably the greatest thing you get yeah. out of being outdoors and exercising whether you're on a bike or you're walking or even um i mean my wife rides a horse and that in itself is its own type of exercise yeah. of, of doing that so yeah. yeah good stuff i i strongly recommend <laughs> <laughs> like nature outdoor activities for people like you say whether it's walking or running or hiking you know, whether, uh, you know, we love cycling. Mm -hmm. Talk, talk a little bit about how you've encouraged cyclists through the NICA program. Well, we, NICA stands for the National Interscholastic Cycling Association. So NICA is based out of, they're, they're a national 501c3 organization. They're out of California, uh, is where their office is. And that's where they were started. NICA now has about 30 leagues in 30 states. I'm sorry, 30 leagues in 29 states because California has two leagues. And so it's been around for 10, 11 years, 13 years. So we recently just started a league. Well, recently we started about three and a half to four years ago, worked with Leland Danes uh, to start forming the Kansas NICA League. Mm -hmm. And so what that is, it's all about, uh, I wish I could... I should be able to remember the five pillars, but it's a uh, community and respect, equality, uh, fun, and there's a fifth one I should I can picture it, but I can't get there. But it's all about um, getting kids on bikes, sixth grade through twelfth grade kids, and and having coaches, having adults in, interact with them, men, women, whatever. So usually the ratio is about two adults to every four to six kids. Uh, and then I think we have something like 30,000 kids involved in the sport on the, on a nat on the national level. And there's about 15,000 coaches. Okay. So it's very adult intensive. Mm -hmm. Um, most of the events have, they, they have camping that goes with the event. I mean, they come out on the front on the Saturday, they camp, the course gets set up, they camp, they race the next day. And it's not about who wins or anything like that. I mean, we do have winners, but it's mm -hmm. about getting the kids involved and having them on bikes. Yeah. They do, they have to do weekly practices and things like that. So, but in Kansas, we had about this last year, we had four events, uh, we're a spring season. So we had four events and about, uh, about a hundred kids involved and about 60 coaches. And so we have eight teams. I think we're just adding a ninth or 10th team for next year. And, uh, there's a, but if you look up, I mean, if someone wants to go look up, it's look up NICA and in Kansas, we're a nonprofit. So we're always looking, you know, we, I think we raised about 
a little, a little over $200,000 last year, the last couple of years to get mm -hmm. the league launched, to be able to buy the equipment. We have a trailer and I'm, I'm race operations. So I, the one that goes out and sets up the course mm -hmm. and hauls all the equipment and stuff like that. Yeah. So, uh, but it's, it's, it, but to see the kids, I mean, we see sixth grade on up and boys and girls and they just, it's such a positive experience and yeah. they're on a bike that's and cool. that's what's important. So that's cool. I was mountain biking last week, me and, and Scott Rogers, yeah. and we bumped into Joe Fox who owns cycle city. And I right. did a, I did a, uh, an interview with Joe several months back in the spring, you know, yeah. but, um, uh, I think he was, he had some, a whole group of young kids out and I think it was connected to Nike. Is that right or not? Could is that, be. Is that now, a different, maybe that's just they, a Cycle City thing. Yeah, I'm or maybe sure. they, now there are some other programs being, I think, specialized just trying to get some programs going too okay. uh, to feed into that. Now, he might be associated with the Missouri Nike. Okay. It might be because he's on the it Missouri like side. He, but He yeah. seemed like he said Nike to me, uh, but I could yeah. be, a, you know, yeah. I could yeah. be remembering wrong. But yeah. no, um, but yeah, he had, I bet you they had six, seven, eight kids on mountain bikes. And yeah, 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 it was pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, it just, it, you know, it takes, kids can't participate unless we have an adult. They have to go under a coach. Yeah. And if they don't have a coach, they can't come to races and the coach has to be an adult. And we actually have our, you know, this October, the second weekend in October is our uh, leader summit, which is where we do coaches training. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if, you know, we're always looking for more coaches so we have we gotta, you don't have to be a great bicycle we teach you on the bike skills teach you how to teach the kids it's it's a neat it's a Excellent. very neat organization so, yeah yeah i i just i just uh typed in nica cycling in the google yeah and it came up right yeah, it came right. up instantly yeah there's a lot of nica abbreviations but yeah if you put nica cycling it pops right up yeah if you put nica and or put cycling or put mtb because it's 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 mountain biking uh they don't do road riding or like that it's okay. all it's all about safety for the kids uh the mountain bike courses are all pretty tame courses but okay. we make them so the sixth grade child can be just as successful as the 12th grade really fast after okay in fact like two nika kids out of colorado participated in the tour de france last year which two uh sep coos yeah and the, they're and, calling him the durango kid these yeah, days yeah. right and then there and was then, another kid and i just blanked on the kid's name i think he did it the year before okay sep won a stage of and, the tour de france yeah, this, this last year yeah and, or this year, yeah, I this year. Say yeah, that. yeah, and and yeah, and he was a Nike kid out of Durango. He went to Nike, Colorado. That's cool. So, pretty cool. Awesome. Yeah, and then um, if people wanted to get chamois butter, how would they do that? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you can get it in almost every bike shop. Uh, the just start off with. We have a retailer locator on our website, mm -hmm. and a place to start is just go chamoisbutter.com and mm -hmm. it's C H. It, it sounds like Shammy, S-H-A-M-M-Y, but anyway, it's spelled Shammy, C-H-A-M-O-I-S-B-U-T-T-R.com. And, or it, and it's, on, it's available on Amazon through a lot of different retailers as well. That's probably one of the best places to do it. We do sell direct uh, through our website. Uh, and so, but there's, you can, you can find it. If you could just Google mm -hmm. Shammy Butter, there's a lot of places to get there. Yeah. You know. All right. And then if they want to, if somebody's like going, oh, I'd like to get my kid involved in, in this NICA thing, would do, how would they do that? Uh, we're on Facebook. It'd be the Kansas, um, Kansas MTB. Uh, or you can um, uh, even go to the NICA page and then there's a state. Each state will have its own link to go to the state, and then there's a there's emails to 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 send to our league director, which is Tina Khan, and she's out of Emporia, is where she's at. So, okay. uh, and there's you know it's on Facebook, it's on Instagram, uh, Nike Kansas or Kansas Nike or Kansas MTB. Uh, if you Google around a little bit, it's pretty easy to All find. Right. So cool. Yeah. Well, I always tell people because 
every, most everybody knows I cycle, right? right. And, uh, and they're always, every time they see a cyclist on the road, first of all, we're going to wrap it up here, but first of all, I always like to say, be nice to bicycles <laughs> when you're driving your vehicles, because literally we get the craziest things happen, don't we? Yeah. We, we yeah. literally have people in their vehicles who almost try to run us off the road, flipping yeah. us off. We, we, there's, there's like people don't want bicycles on the road. So my yeah. challenge is always being, be nice to cyclists. Remember, Jesus wants you to love even your enemies. So like, <laughs> even if you think we're your enemy because we're on the road, just be nice, love us anyway. Um, and the other thing that I, I want to say is that people are always saying, I think I saw you out there. <laughs> and I always say, well, if it was purple and yellow, it was either me or one of my teammates. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so there's, there's just, uh, so, so then, then figure out how to do a nice wave and a nice honk and, and give and support us, uh, as you see us on the road. Cause we, uh, we, we love to ride together and, and, uh, I'm so, I, you know, I'm just thankful I can still ride at 60. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I hear you. So I'm, I got a few years on you and I'm just thankful you know, to be riding. So yeah, you're, you're the, you're the person that, uh, keeps me going. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're leading Good. the way. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Kurt, so much for joining us and, uh, appreciate your, your, uh, time to take for this, uh, interview and, we want to encourage everybody to get involved in cycling if you don't have another sport that's uh, already doing that for you. And thanks for tuning in to Spirituality Adventures, and we will see you next time. This concludes today's episode. Thanks for tuning in and listening. Remember, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Remember to like, share, or subscribe to the social media platform that you're using, and then Go to our website, spiritualityadventures.com and make a one-time donation or you can subscribe monthly and receive our special bonus content. Thanks so much.